six, obesity, our special topic. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, six parts, well, they're short, or kind of short, but these topics are all so fascinating. Physical attractiveness, even mere exposure, uh, race and attractiveness, obesity, very interesting topics. Okay, so uh, let's talk about obesity as a stigma. So what is a stigma? Uh, it's really uh, splitting a fine hair, but a stigma is a mark that denotes a spoiled identity. Uh, and what we're talking about is that it's a process by which the reactions of others spoils your normal identity. Uh, and that's a, a, you know, a really important distinction to, to phrase it in that way. Uh, you know, you know, uh, stigma comes mainly from the sociology, sociological fields. And they talk about uh, a dramatological approach uh, to uh, social life. That is, they literally believe that the world is a stage. And so when we are on stage, when we are in public, we are you know, actors and we're trying to present our image of ourselves as who we really are. And I can present myself as smart. I can present myself as macho, I can do whatever I want. Uh, but, you know, because I don't have to reveal all of my backstory to anybody. But what happens if something, a mark or something, uh, spoils that for me? What if uh, I want to hide the fact that I'm really not that macho, and but then something, you know, lets people know that I am not that real macho. I lose control of that ability to control the information I have about my identity. And that is really the important thing about stigma. That is, everybody wants to have a, a sense of control about the picture they paint of themselves to other people. And a stigma is some type of physical mark that uh, you know, makes them lose control of that information they have. And obesity uh, is a mark because when you see somebody who looks heavier than you think they should, then you start to make attributions about who they are and you start to make evaluations of them. And that may not be in line with the identity that that person wants to have. So a overweight person may uh, want to project themselves as a very happy, upbeat person, an intelligent person, uh, but when you see somebody who is overweight, you may say, oh, that person is, you know, unathletic, they're not that smart. If they were smart, they would certainly, like, you know, not be so fat. And so uh, I think that the idea of a mark that makes you lose control of, you know, the, your control over your identity, I think that is really also identifies an, another major problem with a stigma other than just a prejudice. It's a fact that you're losing control of who you are and who you want to present yourself as to other people. And uh, so that's what the stigma is, but let's talk about fat. Uh, and if you talk to biologists and you uh, listen to them talk about people, they'll say that humans are fat chimps. Uh, and they're absolutely right. If you ever look at a chimpanzee, one of our closest relatives, you'll notice uh, that they have very wrinkly skin. Why? They don't have that much subcutaneous fat. Uh, and the, our subcutaneous fat makes our skin puffy, or relatively puffy, so you can't see the wrinkles that well. Uh, and that's a big difference between uh, you know, chimpanzees and us is that we are designed and programmed to put on and carry more fat than chimpanzees. And while that may sound uh, trite or minor, there are some, I think, more significant uh, elements to that. Uh, chimpanzees and humans share 98% of our genes. That is, the things that make us versus chimpanzees different is only 2% of our genetic code. 
So that's not much, not much at all. So whatever it is must be doing something big. And researchers are, you know, currently uh, pro, you know, f uh, focusing in and targeting in on the idea that humans uh, and human intelligence is based on fat. Uh, I saw this like uh, clickbait uh, headline: "Moms with fat bottoms make more intelligent children." Fat in the butt and thighs are building blocks for babies' brains. I looked it up, and it, it is indeed true, uh, and it illustrates my point. That is, humans are the fat chimps. Humans were designed to put on weight. And I want to reiterate that. Humans are designed to put on weight. We're designed to be fat. Uh, it's part of what makes us intelligent. Uh, up until about 20 years ago, uh, researchers knew that there were these like trash cells in our brain, and they called them gluon cells. Uh, there's no singular term for it because they thought that these cells were so much trash that they didn't give them a name like a neuron. So these glial cells, they're ma mostly made of fat. And then 20 years, you know, they thought, why is our brain so full of this, this garbage fat? And then 20 years ago, somebody, you know, researchers started to realize these gluon, these glion cell cells are really important to our intelligence. And so, again, it's not just that having subcutaneous fat made us look, you know, uh, less wrinkly than chimps, or it gave us the ability to go longer uh, through periods of drought and uh, no access to food than chimps, but that fat may be part of what makes us so different or much more intelligent than chimps. So we got to remember, Human, to be human is to be fat. And let's talk about uh, how our body does that. Uh, our body regulates our weight by two major hunger horm hormones, leptin, which is a natural appetite suppressant, and ghrelin, which is a hunger uh, stimulator. And so our body will release different levels of leptin uh, and ghrelin based on its desire to uh, stop us from eating and stop us from putting on weight or to force us to eat and force us to put on weight. Uh, so for example, uh, if you uh, are you know, lower in weight than you normally are, your body will start producing ghrelin and start cutting back on the leptin it produces and you will start to get hungry. How hungry? Uh, back in World War II, they examined uh, subjects uh, uh, in studies on extreme food, uh, di uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, extreme food, uh, you know, situations where they weren't allowed to eat more than something like 500 calories a day for weeks, and you had all these motivated subjects who were very motivated to be in these studies and to follow the directions of not eating, but you saw very extreme behavior. For example, they'd go to the mess hall to eat, and they'd steal silverware from the mess hall, or they'd steal plates from the mess hall, and they'd take them back to their uh, bunks, and they'd hide them under their bunks, and then late at night they'd pull them out from under their bunks and they'd set a place for themselves and they'd just touch the knives and touch the forks and touch the spoons and feel the plates. And this is obsessive compulsive behavior. And what was going on was their brains were making them obsess over food and over eating. And that's the way our bodies work and our minds work to keep us at the weight we are. And we have a set point and for our weight and our body recognizes that set point it's a system we've been talking about systems before in equilibrium and we're at an equilibrium and if we do anything to move away from the equilibrium our body will produce more leptin or more ghrelin to push us back into the equilibrium and it's extreme over a year after somebody lost 10 percent of their weight they still had leptin levels lower and ghrelin levels higher 
than before their weight loss. So even a year after they changed their weight, their bodies were still trying to force them back into their own old equilibrium. That is amazing. Our bodies really want us to stay at the weight that they want us to stay at. Uh, let's talk about the body mass index, which is trash. Uh, the body mass index was introduced in the early 19th century by a mathematician, not a biologist, not a doctor, and it's a formula to measure the degree of ob uh, obesity in the general population. Uh, it's not a measure of your own obesity. It's a measure of our, you know, Astoria. How fat are the people there? Well, let's look at their average BMI, and look, let's look at it compared to, uh, you know, Prospect Point. Also, it makes no allowances uh, for relative proportion of bone, muscle, or fat in the body. In fact, many athletes who are bulked up uh, have a BMI that categorizes them as obese or severely obese. Uh, however, insurance companies can sometimes charge higher premiums for people with a high BMI. So not surprisingly, they lobby for the use of BMI as a measure of individual obesity. And here we see an a, uh, a news uh, title, uh, a, a headline that uh, reflects this. The BMI mislabels 54 million Americans as overweight. And indeed, uh, the BMI is, you know, really not accurate and not helpful. Uh, the more that we focus on it, the more that we're seeing this illusory, uh, you know, obesity ep epidemic in America, which may really not be the case. And let's talk about the other end of the equation, the weight loss industry. That is a $61 billion per year industry in the United States. That is, making people feel that they're fat can earn somebody or a bunch of people $61 billion. Uh, and what about the weight loss programs? Control, controlled studies show programs in general don't work. Uh, any weight loss program you can think of in general does not work. What about any program specifically? Is any program specifically better than any other program? No. Uh, so programs don't work individually better than other programs and any weight loss program doesn't really work at all in general. They generally don't work. They, they have some benefit but not really. So uh, this $61 billion a year is basically wasted on things that don't work. And this is part of a set of con jobs by the weight loss industry. Uh, this is a pictorial illustration of a before and after uh, of a con job. That is, you have a couple people here who, first off, they're slouching in the before picture. Uh, and then what you do is you blow out the woman's hair in the after picture. You give her a push-up bra and a bikini uh, bottom uh, in the after picture. You uh, give the guy a waxing, a very diligent waxing. Uh, and ask them to stand up straight and you put some bronzer on him. And uh, this is a pretty obvious fake before and after picture, uh, but uh, in some ads they have used before and after pictures of different people. Uh, and let me tell you an example of a secret in the weight loss industry. They can actually have real honest fake before and after pictures. And here's how they do it. Uh, professional athletes like Olympians, they train like quite crazy. And one result of training like crazy is that they eat like crazy. But of course they burn off the calories right away. But what happens when they hurt themselves? They stop training. But they don't stop eating. So they usually you know, get fat. Uh, but then once their ankle heals or whatever, they start working out again and they go back down to their normal rate, weight right away. 
So what weight loss companies do is they find Olympic athletes who need the money because they're Olympic athletes uh, who have injured themselves and they say, hey, could you do a before and after photo uh, for Trim Spa or whatever you know, BS uh, weight loss uh, thing you're talking about? And the athletes can really use the Trim Spa. It doesn't have any effect, so you know, they can honestly use it. And what they do is they take the before picture right when the doctor gives them the okay to go back to working out again. And then they honestly come back six weeks later and they take the honest after photo and they look great. And they make the uh, Olympic athlete sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, so they can keep their money and everybody's happy but we're all bamboozled. So uh, that's why people want to uh, have this type of obsession about weight uh, because you know, it makes money for some people. So now let's talk about the stigma. The stigma of obesity is devastating, devastating. Most people would rather be blind than overweight. I once had two blind students in the same class and they laughed when they heard that. Uh, but that's the truth. Most people, if given the choice of what would you rather be, they would rather be overweight than blind. Uh, children who are overweight are less likely to go beyond high school because there's a weight bias from educators. Educators will not help fat children as much as thin children. Uh, also, uh, do I have it here? No. Uh, usually, uh, you know, uh, heavier uh, high school students are less likely to get into college than thinner uh, high school students. Uh, oftentimes you have to do a campus visit or you uh, include your photograph in your uh, application to a college and the educators have bias against giving financial aid or accepting overweight high school students. Uh, over a person's lifetime you have a lower lifetime earning average if you're overweight than if you're normal weight. And also you're more often unemployed at some point during your lifetime if you're overweight than if you're underweight. For example, uh, for men, uh, if you're overweight, you have a 3.4% chance of being uh, unemployed more than if you're normal weight. Uh, for women, uh, oh no, this is men who are normal weight, uh, have a 3.4 percent less likelihood of being unemployed and women have a 6.1 percent likelihood less likelihood of being unemployed uh, if they're overweight and in general there is higher job discrimination for uh, overweight people versus normal weight people also medical practitioners have both explicit and implicit negative attitudes about uh, overweight people and overweight uh, patients. So medical practitioners are not really that supportive or helpful in terms of helping their overweight patients with their weight or weight related uh, illnesses and they usually spend most of their time uh, focusing on their uh, patients weight as a problem when most medical researchers realize that weight is not a significant medical problem and that for most people who are overweight it will not negatively impact their health during their lifetime. Uh, another example, one study asked people to uh, rate the desirability of these uh, types of people as a sex partner. Uh, that is uh, they said, who would you rather have as a sex partner? Who would you least likely have as a sex partner? A healthy partner, a partner in a wheelchair, a partner missing an arm, a partner with a mental illness, a partner with a history of sexually transmitted diseases, or an obese partner. The obese partner ranked lowest below somebody with a history of sexually transmitted diseases, someone with a mental illness, and somebody in a wheelchair. Uh, our cultural stereotypes against obese people are massive, frightening, 
and unneeded. Uh, and they cause much more psychological and much more actual life damage than we really think of. Uh, but uh, we really, uh, as a society, are not ready to really address that. And finally, uh, one thing I like to toss in, even though obese uh, people are least desirable as a sexual partner, one interesting fact is obese women have sex more often and during sex they have orgasm more often than normal weight women or lower weight women. Uh, the reason why is that for women to be normal, what we consider normal or lower weight, they have to really focus on denying what they want, which is food. And that uh, general psychology of denial prevents them from enjoying uh, sexual activity uh, but, you know, because they are focusing and forcing themselves to not to really dull any type of feelings they have from their bodies. So that is the end of our uh, part six and hope you enjoyed it. I always find this stuff fascinating. Uh, see you in synchronous class.